The second movie in our new series, The Great Movies, is Gary Ross's 1998 masterpiece, Pleasantville. Change. What's outside of Pleasantville? There's some places where the road keeps going. You shouldn't cover that up. What is that? What's going on? Rain! Honey, I'm home! New Line Cinema presents... Look at my face. It'll go away. I don't want it to go away. Something is happening to our town. Jeff Daniels, William H. Macy, Joan Allen, Reese Witherspoon, and Toby McGuire. So what's gonna happen now? I don't know. Pleasantville. What are we gonna do, Bob? Well, we're safe for now. Thank goodness we're in a bowling alley. And we're back, like we never left. Welcome to the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I want to thank you all for spending some of your, hopefully, happy hump day with me here in New York. Once again, we're going to skip past all that promotional jazz and get right to the guts of the episode. Today we'll mark the second entry in our new and ongoing series called simply The Great Movies. The first episode dealt with Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, a trailblazing, pioneering, groundbreaking film, which is generally regarded to be the first modern horror film. Rather than do a movie that you would expect, rather than have the second episode be Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver, or Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull, or Goodfellas, or Steven Spielberg's Raiders of the Lost Ark, or even a Schindler's List, or Francis Ford Coppola's The Godfather. We're going to do something else. We're going to take a movie that would rarely be classified in a list known as The Great Movies, but as a film, a bit of a Gen X standard, at least for some segments of Gen X like me, who are geeks when it comes to movies, I hope. But a film that I believe to be an out-and-out masterpiece, one of the best films from the greatest movie decade of them all, and that would be the 1990s. The film in question, entry number two of the great movies, is Gary Ross's extraordinary, at times whimsical, at times very sober and serious, comic fantasy, Pleasantville. I remember when Pleasantville first, when they started to screen the trailer, And I'm pretty sure I first saw the trailer for Pleasantville. It would have been the fall into the winter of 1997. That was a a big year for Hollywood with Titanic wrapping things up and winning an Oscar that, I mean, if we're being honest, it probably should have gone to L.A. Confidential. But I love James Cameron. I was happy he finally got his Oscar. He should have won Best Director for Aliens. He should have won Best Director for Terminator 2. He got nominated for neither of those films. So if the Academy said, we fucked up, We're going to give Jimmy his Oscar because he made a spectacle movie the way they used to do it in the old days, the days of films such as Ben-Hur, whatever. But I had read bits and pieces about Pleasantville before seeing the trailer. And it is such a truth. This is not a criticism of Hollywood, but it's such a truth that, and ask yourself this, how many times do we see a trailer that looks really interesting What a concept, and a movie is, it either doesn't fulfill the promise of the premise, the promise of the unusual, interesting concept, or it just isn't the movie that they advertise. I've seen both of those things happen. What I knew about Pleasantville from what I had read, I already considered myself a fan of Gary Ross. He had done big, which covers some similar territory as far as it's set in what appears to be a reality land, but there's a kind of magical realism to that reality. Pleasantville even more so than Big. But I was already a fan of Gary Ross, and I was a fan of Reese Witherspoon, William H. Macy from films such as Fargo um, and uh, Air Force One, he has a small role, and Joan Allen, specifically Searching for Bobby Fischer, even though she got Oscar nominated for, I think, The Crucible and I think her role as Pat Nixon in Nixon up to that point. I was a fan of a lot of the people. I liked Tobey Maguire already. Um, 
uh, Reese Witherspoon, I was already a fan. From the first time seeing her in the movie Man in the Moon, not Man on the Moon, Man in the Moon. So I was kind of following her career. And earlier in 1998, she had another movie that I knew about in the can that was coming out. It, I think, released either January or February of 98, movie Twilight, with an unbelievable cast. Susan Sarandon and Gene Hackman play her parents. James Garner plays a private eye. And Paul Newman, in his last conventional leading man role, is the star. So Reese was doing great work, and she was in this movie Pleasantville, and Toby, and I love this cast, uh, J.T. Walsh, another actor I was a fan of, couldn't wait. So I read something about it, and it said, two kids, two teenagers living in present day, 1997, 98, uh, Los Angeles, or wherever it is in California, are accidentally transported into a 1950s TV show like A Father Knows Best or Ozzy and Harriet. Honestly, that premise was only mildly interesting to me. Still looking forward to seeing the movie, but I felt like that sort of thing had kind of been done before. Fish Out of Water, a body switch movie such as Big. Wasn't that interesting. But then while seeing, let's say it was Francis Coppola's The Rainmaker. Let's say that it was that movie that I was watching. The trailer opens with just what I said. They get transported into the 50s TV series, and you have a few laughs. Nobody has sex in the 50s. Everybody eats bacon nonstop. Everyone smokes. There's no lung cancer. All of the kind of humorous tropes. But then, then, all of a sudden, something happens, and the black and white of the 1950s era turns to color. When that took place. When that happened in the trailer, I sat up in my chair. This is something different. And sure enough, the trailer promised something different, and the movie delivered way beyond my expectation. So when the film finally landed, I'm not exactly sure of the release date. I'm going to give it to you now. As you know, I don't like to give you bad information. It came out in the fall of 1998. So that would mean that I probably saw the trailer at the beginning of 98. I may have even seen the trailer watching the movie Twilight, uh, the one with Paul Newman and Reese Witherspoon that I had just mentioned. But the idea is the trailer got me really excited for the film because I knew that there was a good potential for quality with Gary Ross and the strength of the cast. It doesn't always work out that way, but it's at least, I felt it was very likely. So the film landed, and it had a bigger budget than you would have thought. It was budgeted around $60 million, which for 1998, for a film that you wouldn't expect to be a special effects heavy type of a movie, it was, it was a substantial budget to get the effects correct and quite frankly, a little bit of a spoiler, a lot of shots where it's black and white and color in the same shot. These things cost money. The film landed and critics such as Roger Ebert gave it unabashed raves. Ebert was a huge fan of it. He didn't have it as his best film of 98. That's the year also of Saving Private Ryan and Shakespeare in Love, which ended up winning Best Picture. But Ebert's best film of 1998, a movie I've talked about on the channel, Alex Proyas, Almost the Matrix before the Matrix, Dark City. But Ebert was a big fan. And most of the other major critics I followed were also saying, uh, this is not what we expected. This is way better than how it was pitched. And that could have been a little bit of misdirection, a little bit intentional. Don't raise expectations. Moderate them. And then when people realize, holy shit, they did something we didn't expect, you've got them. So Pleasantville, I saw the day it opened, went to the movies, and I saw it while well, the night it opened, and right away hit the masterpiece button. I thought it was as good as big if we're going to compare Gary Ross classics, but I was blown away. I was dazzled. The performances are so good up and down the line. Every important player, even um, a Don Knotts in a small role as a cable repairman, Kind of a cool cable repair man. Loved him. The story starts and goes forth just as I described. But when they introduce color, the movie does not 
do anything like what you expect from that moment forward. It is not a story of fish out of water. That is deliberate misdirection. This is a story about fairness. This is a story about equality. And in a world of this film, as dumb as this sounds on the page or somebody like myself describing it, because this is a movie that has to be seen, the idea that black and white and color don't have to be in opposition. Now, I never really thought of the movie business in terms of black and white and color being in opposition. But there's a reason why they don't make black and white movies anymore, because people are used to seeing things in color. When three-strip Technicolor was formulated, was implemented, most people didn't want any more black and white movies. And then all the way ahead, a couple of decades after three-strip Technicolor, you have Alfred Hitchcock making Psycho in black and white. Al, why don't you shoot, in color, shoot it in color? Because I don't want to. This movie will work better in black and white. Here's a little trivia for you. If somehow you're ever at a bar or a party, and in order to win a raffle or some kind of, you know, if you get this question right, you get a new car. Who invented three-strip Technicolor? The guy's name is Herbert Kalmus. Thank me when you win the raffle. Herbert Kalmus. But in the world of Pleasantville, because that's the name of the TV show, Toby Maguire as... Um, his name, what is his name? David? Yeah, his name is David, and Reese plays Jennifer. Unlikely brother and sister. I mean, give me a break. But in a world of the film, they are presented as brother and sister. And David, Toby's character, and this is the pre-Cider House rules, pre-Wonder Boys, pre-Seabiscuit, pre-Spider-Man, Toby Maguire. The only big film that he had made up to this point was The Ice Storm. Pretty good movie. It's also uh, with Joan Allen, I think. He's a idiot savant when it comes to this 50s TV show. You know, it's supposed to be 40 years prior. Now it's 60-something years prior. You know, in 1998 is a long time ago here. But he is a, a, a savant when it comes to this TV show, Pleasantville. And he wants to watch the show. He has a chance to win $1,000 or something if he answers questions. It's some nonsense. It's really not that important. And Reese Witherspoon has his sister, Jennifer. The plot swings into motion when they're kind of fighting over the controller there's a, a helpful repairman played by Don Knotts, and they are magically transported into a TV show called Pleasantville, which is in black and white. And everything is, as I said, people eat enormous amounts of food. Everybody looks great. Nobody knows anything about health. The basketball team has never lost a game. It never rains in Pleasantville. Nobody has sex. Kids go to Lover's Lane to just sit and stare into space. That's what Pleasantville is. David, playing Bud, his last name is Parker on the show, and Mary Sue, Reese Witherspoon's character of Jennifer, they kind of conform at first. And David, as Bud, wants to only conform. But Reese's character and she's very, very good. I would say this is still one of her best performances. Character of Jennifer. She's a girl who we think doesn't take school seriously, just wants to party, have a good time, hook up with a certain guy. She turns out to have a lot more going on than you would think at first blush. And she wants to live. We're stuck here. Why do we have to do what everyone in the show is doing. Why? Well, because we don't want to disrupt their world. Well, why the fuck not, bud? Maybe this shit needs a little bit of disrupting. We don't know how long we're going to be stuck here. Fuck it. So she starts taking actions that upset her brother, who's her brother on the show, as well as real life. And things start to happen. She starts dating the most attractive guy, the hottest guy in school, played by the late, great Paul Walker. Paul Walker is so good in this film. 
with the smile, the hair, and the fact that, yeah, he is a really attractive guy, and you could see why she's willing to fuck shit up just to get with him. But he's in Pleasantville. When they start gazing soulfully at each other, and Reese is giving him looks that are not really kosher, she's giving him looks that you could feel in your hip pocket, to quote Raymond Chandler, he starts to not feel well. Starts to not feel well. It's like, I think something's wrong with me, Mary Sue. I don't feel good. Oh, that's normal. I got a huge laugh in the theater. Oh, that's normal is her reaction to the fact that he is aroused for the first time in his, well, it's not really a life. He's a TV character, but for the first time in his TV character life, he's aroused. And guess what? I think they have S-E-X. And then other kids start going to Lover's Lane or whatever it's called, and they do something other than stare into space. And maybe if they're going steady for a year, they can graduate to holding hands. No? Just like when I say we're going to skip past all that promotional... Je they skip past all that dull stuff, like holding hands and gazing mournfully at each other, and they even skip past long, sweet, gentle kisses and go right to sex. Now, as absurd as it seems, because they are, after all, parents of two children, Joan Allen, spectacular as ever, wants to have a real talk with her daughter because she has heard that her daughter is doing things and there's stuff going on in Lover's Lane. What's going on? So she says, sweetie, you're a good girl. And even William H. Macy, who's terrific as the father, he says, she's a wonderful young lady. We have nothing to worry about. Well, you're right about that and you're right about that. Just not the way you think. So when Joan Allen, as earnestly as anyone has ever delivered lines, when she says, sweetie, what goes on up there? She's not angry. She's simply asking a question. And Reese, as now Mary Sue, basically tells her, sex! And Joan Allen, as sweet and winsome as possible, and not kidding, asking a serious question, she goes, what is sex? Now I'm watching the movie and I'm dying and the audience is cracking up around me. You have two kids. You sleep in separate beds. Actually, we don't even see them go to sleep, or do we? You sleep in separate beds. There's no romance between the two of you. But you have two kids and you're asking what sex is. It is so accurate to the realities of those TV shows. Because parents, even parents who are presented as loving each other, that's all. They're platonic. The kids appeared through osmosis, I guess. So, Joan Allen asks a few more questions of her daughter. And her daughter gives her some very dirty ideas. Mom, why don't you... We don't exactly hear what she says. Joan Allen goes into the bath. And before you know it, an explosion of color. An explosion. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So as people, characters, in Pleasantville begin to do different things, as they begin to change, as they begin to move past the old ways, there is more and more of an explosion of color. It isn't just taking risks, it's change itself. And so you have, on the one side, the now Bud and Mary Parker heralding change. And the irony of Bud, David, is that he's still in black and white because he hasn't actually changed. He's still resistant. So the character that Toby plays is a tricky character because he reaches a point where he understands this is good. I was opposed to it, 
but for the wrong reasons. And he's seeing so many people, characters, people, within the world of Pleasantville, changing for the better and enjoying life for however long they have. And J.T. Walsh is part of the kind of last stronghold of the old ways of Pleasantville, where he doesn't want all of this color. He doesn't want any change. Black and white movies are good enough. If you want to put a Hollywood hat on here, because there were a lot of people, there were people that didn't know that the coming of sound was going to alter the business the way it did, but there were a lot of people that felt movies belonged in black and white. And there are those to this day, and there's nothing wrong with appreciating the magic of black and white. And I remember when Gus Van Zandt, after doing Good Will Hunting, was, um, he did the, the remake of Psycho. And there was a lot of talk about, you're going to do it. You've got Vince Vaughn playing um, Norman Bates. Good casting. You have Anne Heche in the Janet Lee role. Also very good casting. It was very well cast. No joke. But should they just shoot it in black and white? And he decided not to. I think the movie was always going to be a disappointment just because you're trying to copy. You're trying to recreate something that was perfect. It ain't so easy. But even with that, there was the argument, do we do black and white or do we do color? So you have these, 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 these guys, old white guys, even if they're not that old, they're coming across as stodgy old white guys. They're complaining because heavens to Betsy, I came home last night and there was no dinner waiting for me. I'm going to cry because there was no dinner waiting for me. What am I to do? My wife is out gallivanting. Where is my dinner? Or William H. Macy, I think it was his dinner was cold. It was something stupid like that. And J.T. Walsh, God bless, one of the all-time goats of this sort of role. He usually played heel or heel-ish supporting characters. He was a phenomenal film actor. And in the 90s, he gave so many great performances. He was just knocking them out one after another. And Jack Nicholson, who adored him, and they worked together in A Few Good Men and they had great scenes. But when Jack, who I love, who doesn't, when Jack won his Oscar for As Good As It Gets, J.T. Walsh had passed. And the way Jack put his hand on his heart and said, for J.T., I think he said for J.T., it got me. Because J.T. Walsh was a home run hitter. And he's phenomenal in A Few Good Men. And later in the decade, 96, uh, just before this, in Billy Bob Thornton's Sling Blade, he's fantastic. And in a different kind of role, in a likable, audience-pleasing role. He's in the movie Outbreak. He plays what I think is the Secretary of State, but he plays a guy who is against the prevailing sentiment which says, we need to sacrifice this entire town and probably about a 10-mile radius around this town we've closed off. We have to kill everybody to save the rest of the world. And he comes in to the scene with a copy of the Constitution. And he says, this is the United States Constitution. I've read it. It doesn't say a damn thing in here about blowing up a town. Those are real people, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. They're not statistics. They're not numbers. They're flesh and blood. He could have gotten the Best Supporting Actor nomination just for that one scene. But J.T. Walsh plays a villain in Breakdown, which was a previous movie he did before this, opposite Kurt Russell, and is fucking scary as hell. Well, Pleasantville, it's a little bit of a different kind of an antagonistic character. He just doesn't want things to continue unfolding as they are. So you have these guys, they're having their night bowling, and they're still in black and white. They're still bowling really high scores. And somebody asks J.T. Walsh, he plays Big Bob. He says, well, what are we going to do, Bob? He says, well, at least we're safe for now. 
because we're in a bowling alley. As a kid whose grandpa owned a bowling alley, I was all but screaming at that line. At least we're safe for now because we're in a bowling alley. So without going into major spoilers, there are scenes of great beauty and great sadness. And Jeff Daniels plays the proprietor of a kind of old school luncheonette and a diner type place, many of which still exist. We've got mom and pop coffee house or coffee shop, if you will, with good food. And Jeff Daniels plays an artist. It's not enough for him to just make burgers and fries and Toby goes to work for him and that's the connection there. But Jeff Daniels' character, he falls in love with Joan Allen and the movie skirts the edge of adultery. Again, something that would never happen, did not happen on shows like Ozzy and Harriet or Father Knows Best. He wants more. And Joan Allen, now that she's been awakened, she wants more. And the question is, William H. Macy's character, is he capable of change? Can he change? There's so much in the way of things that we're left with when the movie is over, things to ponder and chew on. And although the film makes it very clear where it stands, there's still a lot to ponder. If you were in this kind of situation as David and Jennifer, both so beautifully acted by Toby and Reese, would you just conform? Would you keep Pleasantville the way that it is for as long as you're there? Or would you immediately start fucking shit up? I don't know. I know as a younger person, I would have gone along with it. I would have conformed. I wouldn't have tried to mess with anyone's apple cart. But as an older person, you drop me in and somehow I'm suddenly married with kids and we're in a black and white world of a TV show? Yeah, I'd be a rabble rouser. Absolutely 100%. Now, Pleasantville is not free on streaming anywhere that I know of. It is a movie worth seeing and worth the $2 rental on Amazon Prime or Apple or whichever platforms you can, you can find it on. It was nominated for three Academy Awards. And as I intimated earlier, it got widespread critical acclaim. There were plenty of major critics that had it as one of their top 10 films, if not top five for 1998. But it bombed at the box office. I just don't think that audiences were ready for it. They weren't ready for a film as challenging as it was. And there were people that who thought that they were going into a lighthearted comedy, maybe they didn't see the trailer, and were shocked at some of the things the film gets into, which I won't talk about, in the second half. It is a way more challenging movie than it appears to be in the kind of light, rollicking early portions. And even if Toby and Reese look nothing alike, they actually have really good chemistry as brother and sister. And where Reese goes in the story, it's really beautiful. And I love Toby's performance. This is it, certainly in his top five, maybe top three. Cider House Rules got a ton of acclaim. And uh, Michael Caine, or Sir Michael Caine, won Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, which he's always kind of, not even joked, he's always said he thought Haley Joel Osment earned the award for The Sixth Sense. And then he and Haley worked together on Secondhand Lies. He was a huge fan of his. But I think it's up there with Toby's finest, finest work. Because he's so, he's so engaging as first David and then Bud. It is just a gorgeous movie. Beautifully shot. The cinematography is stupendous. And for a film that doesn't really have rah-rah moments, it leaves you feeling good. And as if maybe, heaven forbid... You might look at things a little bit differently after you've seen the film. And if that isn't great art, then I don't know what is. Pleasantville, written and directed by Gary Ross from 1998. The second entry in our new and continuing series called The Great Movies. Starring Reese Witherspoon, Tobey Maguire, Joan Allen, William H. Macy... Jeff Daniels, and a fantastic J.T. Walsh, and also Paul Walker. 
This has been episode 277 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I want to thank you all so much for joining me for this Wednesday morning podcast here in New York. If you check out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platforms such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back with a new episode real, real soon. Till then, peace. Thank you.